Hello, my name is Michael Mascalera. I'm the CEO of Wave Wireless Advanced Vehicle Electrification. Yeah, so in California, I think the cap and trade program has been one of the most effective things implemented to control and basically create an open market for emissions and reduce the overall emissions. In addition to that, some of the voucher incentive programs established by the other state agencies uh, have effectively reduced the initial cost of both vehicles and vehicle infrastructure. And I think they played a big role in spurring the initial adoption of electric buses in particular in California. And by comparison, I think the you've probably followed what's going on in China. The city of Shenzhen has been the first to do a 100% conversion of their bus fleet to electric of 16,000 vehicles. I think that played a huge role and set an example for the U.S. to follow. Yeah, so to stimulate adoption in other states and countries, I think we need some significant deployments in the state of California and elsewhere that others can use as a model for adoption. Uh, from my experience, I've seen these small deployments. People will start with one electric vehicle, a bus or a truck, and it really doesn't prove much. So I think we need a full case study for various sized fleets and agencies for others to look at the critical data and determine that it actually makes financial sense to adopt electric vehicles. Yeah, it's a great question. So we focus on medium and heavy duty vehicles and in contrast to light duty vehicles where people are typically charging at work or at home, uh, heavy duty vehicles are out on the same route every day and their loads are typically higher, their consumption is higher, and they have, in many cases, frequent stops, uh, either during their normal route to load and unload passengers or sometimes to take a break or a lunch. So it presents an opportunity to do what we call in-route charging, so you can continually keep the battery topped off rather than relying on going back to the depot or the analog of the, the home to charge the vehicle. In light-duty vehicles, obviously, the batteries are typically smaller, Heavy-duty vehicles, they're larger. If you look at the consumption for heavy-duty versus light-duty, it's about 10 times higher. So just rough numbers about 0.3 kilowatt hours per mile versus 3 kilowatt hours per mile of consumption. So by nature, that dictates not only having a larger battery to get the vehicle through its daily route, but also in many cases having a higher charging power available to top off the battery. Got it. So there's certainly the charging system, which is how the energy is delivered, but the other piece of it is managing the vehicle grid integration aspect. So with all the electric vehicles now connecting onto the grid, we need to do a better job of managing the load and the demand that's being placed on the grid. So some of the things that are being done is what's called distributed energy resources. So think of it as placing stationary batteries alongside where a charger would be to offset things like demand charges and, and time of use charges. Uh, and then other things we see, at least in transit, a lot of the entities are interested in putting a large photovoltaic array in conjunction with either the depot or the in route charger to also help offset some of the charges and to feed batteries in stationary storage configuration to also mitigate the cost and demand on the grid. Yeah, I agree. It's definitely not the norm yet. And I think what it really comes down is something that's more application specific. And in the case of, say, photovoltaic, as you probably know, it requires a very large area. So it's particularly suitable in a place like a, a depot where you might want to have a covered space for your buses anyway, or a covered parking, parking case, uh, space in the case of passenger vehicles. Uh, but it really comes down to cost. Uh, and in addition, there's stationary storage, but again, there's a fairly large footprint required to do that, similar to photovoltaic cells. So it actually requires a lot of area or a completely different design consideration when trying to optimize the overall cost and efficiency of the system.
Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I may be a little bit biased, but here's my take on it. I think we're all basically lazy. And I think that given the choice of plugging in versus having an automated wireless charging solution, I think we'll all adopt that. And the analogy that I like to draw is I spent a lot of time in the mobile device world in the earlier days, and I think what will happen is a similar trend that once the infrastructure is built out for wireless charging, similar to the way it was for mobile devices, I think that the adoption will happen at a much faster pace. So, similar to the way wireless took over mobile communications, I think wireless charging will take over EV electrification. Alright, so I think it'll be the Jetsons flying car, if you remember that, and I'm kidding, but I'm not, actually. Uh, there are a lot of startups out there now, companies that are making all electric airplanes, also probably followed a lot of the work going on with drones. So it shows that you can actually carry payloads, you can carry people around. So I think the, the future, at least the big vision of where this thing's going, is gonna carry from those two initial innovations. And I think that you'll see flying cars that are wirelessly charged and you'll be able to move people and goods around more efficiently. Yes, so to state it, the conclusion first, the way I look at it is, yes, EV adoption has been fairly slow. Yes, it's been limited by things like lack of regulatory environment, uh, lack of high energy density batteries, uh, costs that are initially high, but the way I look at it is, wireless charging goes hand in hand with autonomous vehicles. So if you don't have drivers, you don't have anybody to plug in and unplug the vehicles. So the way I look at this is, Sometimes it takes multiple advances in technology that are happening in parallel to really create a new industry, in, uh, in this case, electric vehicles. So I think looking at the limitations of EVs and their adoption, the limitations on build out of the infrastructure, I think once you're autonomous to it, I think that the whole EV industry is going to take off uh, to another order of magnitude.